أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله صلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to our second session on audit sampling As you remember we started our discussion with an overview of auditing and we said that the client prepares the financial statements over a period of 12 months and we also said that generally conventionally because we have only a few weeks and we are fewer in number we cannot look at everything that the client has done so now someone remind us when I say we who do I refer to when I say we who are we in the context of auditing when I say we, who are we? Independent external auditors. Excellent, Sharat. Independent external auditors. Who are we auditing? Who are we auditing? When you say the company under audit we have another name for for them we call them client excellent very good so we are the independent external auditors independent meaning we are not associated with the success and failure of the company that we are auditing it doesn't make a difference for us directly if the client is uh, making a lot of profit or a client is not making a lot of profit we're independent of that and external means we are outsiders we do not work as an employee for the company so we are external we are from outside and we're independent we are working for the board of directors with the management of the company to certify their financial statements to give our opinion on the financial statements and because we cannot look at everything that the client has done we have to take a sample so we're going to start our discussion on sampling today today is the first day of the first chapter we did an overview of auditing one in our last class before we get into the main topic I would like to share with you uh, some tips on how to effectively learn you know in most uh, cases the students are given the content the material to learn but rarely uh, the student taught on how to learn in your schools in the university uh, you don't have a, a proper training on how to learn the material how to best learn the material and I'm going to try to share with you from time to time uh, techniques of learning more effectively so that you can learn you can maximize the time that you spend the first uh, couple of points I would like to share with you today are the first one is you must touch information multiple times preferably in different ways to move it from short-term to long-term memory now the we have in our brain we have short-term memory and we have long-term memory the short-term memory immediately gets the information that is coming from outside I'll give you an example let's say I were to give you a five-digit number 77219 the number is 77219 and then I go and discuss some other things and talk about something for a couple of minutes and go here and there for a short time and then ask you the number so can you tell me the number I gave you the number that I gave you just a few seconds ago can you repeat that number seven seven two one nine seven seven two one nine right seven seven two one nine right so very good so this is in your short-term memory now if you do not hear this number between now and the end of the class let's say we talk about many things for 30 40 50 minutes and you try to learn some new concepts etc etc you might write down something you might listen to something you might 
uh, discuss something, you might ask questions and so forth. And at the end, if I were to ask you this number, in many cases, you might not remember it, right? You might forget that number. Uh, but because it was in your short-term memory, and the, the, the space in the short-term memory is little, and the time you can keep something in your short-term memory is also very small. This is little time and little space. But we have, each one of us uh, has a long-term memory, and the space in the long-term memory is, uh, some people say, unlimited. Of course, you know, there is a limit, but we don't know what that limit is. No one has exhausted the entire long-term memory. So you can live for 90, 100 years, and you can keep adding information to your long-term memory, and it will not run out. The space will not run out. But there is a way of putting the material from your short-term memory to your long-term memory so that you can remember it. I'll give you an example. Let's say, you know, you, you had a phone number, a home phone number when you were growing up. Think back to pre-smartphone, pre-mobile phone days when you're three, four years old, five years old, when uh, you had to remember your home phone number and maybe you remembered some other phone numbers like your best friend's phone number, your uncle's phone number, your aunt's phone number. You remember those days? Does it ring a bell? Do you remember or is it before your generation? Do you remember that time? when we had to remember some phone numbers? Anyone? Yeah? So I'm, I'm afraid that in five years I might get a group of students who uh, never experienced life without the smartphones. So the smartphones are making us stupid. We don't hardly remember anything. Anything we have to find or anything we have to look up we go to our phones, and the phone has everything, so we don't remember anything. Uh, we know we don't even look at the phone number that we're calling. We just look at the name, and without the phone, you know, you know how helpless sometimes we feel when we change our phones and we have not imported the data from the old phone, right? You know that feeling, right? I'm sure all of you have changed phones at least once, right? Does it, does it ring a bell? Have you experienced this? Right? Now, what happens, that phone number that you remembered when you were a child, the home phone number, you remember that number because you used that number often. You called that number often. So let's say you have a phone, uh, phone number that you, that's uh, your uncle's phone number or your, your uh, best friend's phone number, and you call that number often. So you remember that number. And let's say that number changed. So you no longer use that number. But let's say five years later, if you saw that number, it would ring a bell with you. You would say, I, I remember this number. Where is this number from? I, I, I know this number. Where this number is coming from? And if you put a little bit of effort, you might recall that that used to be your old home phone number or your friend's phone number, right? Because it's in your long-term memory. So if you want to put something in, in your long-term memory, what you have to do is you need time, goal orientation, supportive feedback, accumulated successful practice, and frequent review. What does that mean? You have to look at the information multiple times and uh, preferably in different ways. So how to put this in practice? Let's say you listen to the lecture today and you ask questions and you have an understanding of the content that we discussed today, to put this in your long-term memory, you have to review the material. You have to read a few pages from the book, let's say, about this topic. You have to perhaps watch a short video that is discussing this topic. You may discuss the topic with one of your friends. There are multiple different ways to make this information more solid in your mind. 
right, by frequently reviewing it. If you leave it alone, right, if you don't do anything with the content after we discuss it today, then it will leave your short-term memory very, very quickly. By the time next week gets here, all of this will be lost. So frequent review and possibly looking at the information in different ways, right? Listening, discussing, reading, right? Writing, all of those things will add to your understanding and retention. Are you following? Am I making any sense? Very good. I need your uh, interaction. I need your feedback frequently. When I ask you a question, I need as many people as possible to respond, yes, no, repeat, etc., so that uh, we can be on the same page, okay? All right. With this in mind, we start our first set of topics. We have five topics in this chapter that we're going to discuss. And we're going to start with the two topics today. The first is the introduction to sampling, and the second is some key concepts uh, in relation to sampling. Auditing standards allow statistical and non-statistical sampling. As independent external auditors, when we go to perform an audit, on a client's financial statements. We have to follow some guidelines, and those are called auditing standards. We have to follow the auditing standards. The auditing standards allow us, the independent external auditors, to take a statistical sampling and take a non-statistical sampling. And we are going to learn both of these. We're going to learn how to take a statistical sampling, and we're going to take we're going to learn how to take a non-statistical sampling. A well-developed accounting information system and advanced software reduce the use of sampling techniques. Clients that use sophisticated ERP systems, enterprise resource planning systems such as SAP or Oracle or other similar softwares to process their accounting data, M make our lives easier when we come in as auditors. So we can look at the data closely. We can take a larger sample. We can use the software to take a sample for us so we don't have to do a lot of manual work. And if that were the only case, if all clients used sophisticated softwares, then uh, we would not have to use any manual knowledge. But the case is not such. We need to learn how to do the sampling somewhat manually, and then we can use the software. Some people might argue that, you know, why do we have to go back and learn the manual stuff because everything is done with computers and so forth. What is the purpose? You remember when you were in kindergarten and grade one and grade two, you learned how to add and subtract and multiply and divide manually. Do you remember that 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago? The calculators were available at the time. The calculators were invented and they were available and they were cheap and every household had many calculators. But you were not allowed to use the calculators, right? Because you needed to learn how to count using your brain, your hands, etc. So that you can count with or without a calculator. And I encourage my students to do the math, the small counting and so forth using their hands, using their paper without the help of a calculator. You know, I, fi I find sometimes students adding 2 plus 3 using a calculator. I mean, this is ridiculous. You need to use your cognition. You need to use your brain. The more you use it, the smarter it will remain. The more you rely on the machine to do your work, right, the slower and the more lazy your, your brain is going to be. So 
we need to learn I am a very uh, big believer of learning how to do each activity without the help of a machine and the reason is you are going to be an accountant you're going to be an auditor inshallah even if the computer were to be taken away from you you know there are some accountants and auditors I had an I had a student in my class an advanced class the student was working for a big company in the accounting department and I asked the student you know what is the next step in the procedure and the student told me I don't know uh, the computer does it I don't know how, how it's done uh, the computer does it I know that the output I know what the output is so I use the output and that is something that I do not want any one of my students to say ever they need to know how to do it even if the computer was not there now you use the computer to do it faster and more efficiently and more accurately that is fine we need to use it but we cannot be such that without the computer we are totally useless we are no longer accountants and auditors do you follow so we need to know how to use our smarts our intellect our our cognition to do it technology will not replace the auditors no matter how much advanced technology you have and the reason uh, for the reasons for for that is number one control procedures require human beings now control procedures internal controls uh, are a, a, a very important part of any business and if you took accounting information system with me uh, we discussed internal controls in there and I'm going to discuss it now briefly so if we have uh, any students I know we at least have a couple of students from the AIS class internal controls ensure three things in, an, in a company there are three things that the internal controls are supposed to ensure can you remember the first one can you tell us can you share with me and all, all of us from your AIS class the first goal that we are interested in we the auditors are interested in the accountants are interested in in the internal controls the first one anyone internal controls internal controls are procedures that ensure number one True and fair financial statements. Very good, Sharat. That is the first one. Preparation of true and fair financial statements. So the company wants that the financial statements prepared are true and fair. So the company hires qualified accountants. The company reviews the work of the qualified accountants. The company reviews the work of the qualified accountants it, it trains them it provides them with the computer and software to prepare the financial statements what is the second procedure or the second goal of internal controls second goal of internal controls anyone second goal is to ensure effective and efficient operations effective and efficient operations 
every business wants to run its operations very well and it wants to run it effectively and efficiently effectively means that the company is doing what is right right so it's serving the customers it's preparing the goods it's producing the goods it's uh, managing its people the way it should be done that's effectiveness efficient operations mean the activities are done without waste right so there is no waste when you're producing the goods there is no waste of time uh, effort uh, resources so effectively is doing the right thing efficiently is doing it without any waste right so every business wants to have some procedures in place to ensure that the employees and the managers are working effectively and efficiently what is the third economic digestion that's the third compliance with regulations very good compliance with regulations right compliance with regulations very good so you have to go back to your notes and that is what I was saying the other day keep your material keep the book keep the notes keep the material so that when you have to look it up you can easily look it up you follow you will not remember everything keep the material write down make good notes for you this is not something that you're going to need on, only in the final exam this is something that you're going to need information that we are discussing today and and we're going to discuss in this class is information that you will get benefit from when you go and work as a professional accountant and auditor so make good notes I'm going to try and give you as many practical examples as possible from my work as a, a CPA a certified public accountant in, in the US I worked almost a decade as a certified public accountant working with clients and I'm going to share with you many techniques and so forth and information so that when you go even when you go to a job interview or after you get the job inshallah you will get benefit from this information and I get emails from from former students who are auditors and, and accountants working in different companies how they're getting benefit from this which is alhamdulillah is very good and my goal is to to give you that information which is not just going to help you pass the final exam but to make you an accountant and auditor who is good at doing what he does right all right so compliance with regulations is following the law of the land following the regulations where the business is operating so for example there is a labor law in in Qatar that the employees should not be working outside in the heat in the afternoon during the summer months because it's too hot and your managers and your employees must know this and they must comply so this is compliance with regulations so ensuring that is internal control so again these control procedures requires human beings the control procedures require human beings so you, the technology is helpful but it will never replace the humans and we as auditors are interested in the internal controls especially those that are related to the true and fair financial statements the preparation of the true and fair financial statements the second reason why technology will not uh, eliminate the auditors is testing procedures require physical examination so when we come in as auditors we do some tests we perform some tests with some documents by talking with people by visiting certain places by by observing some people doing certain things right so we are going to discuss all of that uh, slowly step by step but those require human beings those, those require intellect as well as emotions so human beings are the best in doing that machines can only do so much the machines cannot replace the human beings the third 
is evidences must be gathered from third parties. So we need documents that are produced not by the client and not by the auditor. The, the client is the first party, the auditor is the second party. There are third parties outside the client's business and outside the auditor that provide us with information that help us in auditing the client. Can you give me an example of a third party? Can anyone give an example of a third party, an outsider that will help us gather information? Suppliers, very good. Who else? Hmm? Where does the client keep its money? Bank, right? Absolutely, definitely, may, not maybe, but definitely banks, right? Who else? The customers, right? The government, right? All of those are third parties, and we need to get information, and you know, auditors need to, to do that, so you need human beings to do that, to interact with the third parties and get information, confirm information, and we are going to discuss exactly what, what is done, right? We're going to learn this, all right? Very good. Now, the, the next uh, 20 minutes or so, we're going to learn the following key concepts that are related to audit sampling. The concepts are number one, audit sampling, number two, sampling risk, number three, confidence level, and number four, tolerable and expected error, right, along with precision. So let's start with the first one. The first one is audit sampling. Selecting a representative sample is important so the conclusion can be applied to the population. So we need to take from the population a sample that is representative of the population so that our conclusion of the population is correct. Clear? It's clear. Anybody else? I need you to tell me if it is not clear, right? I am expecting somebody to say it's not clear because what I said is not in any way detailed, right? Let me explain this to you since no one will say. I know it's not clear. Let's say you have a population of 100 individuals. You have a population of 100 individuals. You have in that you have 50 males and 50 females. You have 100 individuals. You have 50 males and 50 females. Now I'm going to take a sample from the 100, a sample of 10. If I take a sample of 10 and in that 10 I have 5 males and 5 females and I make a conclusion that 50% of the population is males and 50% of the population is females. Is my conclusion correct? If I take a sample of 10 and in there 5 males and 5 females I have, I make a conclusion 50-50. Is my conclusion correct? Yeah, yes, I guess. What do you mean I guess? What is the population distribution? The distribution of population is male and female. What is it? 50-50, right? It's 50-50. And when I take five males and five females and I say the population is 50-50, that is correct, right? That is absolutely correct. Not There is no ambiguity here. But let's say I take a sample of 10, right? I take a sample of 10 and... I have eight males and two females, and I say that 80% of the population is males, 
two twenty percent of the population's population is females. Is that conclusion correct? Is that conclusion correct? That is incorrect because my sample is not representative. My sample does not represent the population. I have a sample that is not representative of the population. Therefore, my conclusion is incorrect. So, when we are taking a sample, we try to take a sample. We try to learn techniques of taking a sample that is representative of the population so that when we make a conclusion about the population with that sample, our conclusion is correct. Is that clear? The idea of the representative sample and the conclusion made from the representative sample. Is that clear now? Of course, when I take a sample and the distribution of the sample is similar to the distribution of the population and I make a conclusion of the distribution of the population based on the sample, it will be correct if my sample is representative. A representative sample is that which has a similar distribution to the population. Is that clear? Okay. All right. So that's representative sample. Now, there is always a risk. There is always a risk that we are taking a sample that is not representing the population. So the sample distribution is not the same as the distribution of the population. And there is a risk of making two types of errors. The first type is type 1 error and the second type is type 2 error. Let's understand one more example. Let's say you take an exam and it has 100 questions. It has 100 questions. And you answered 80 questions correctly and you answered 20 questions incorrectly right you answered 80 questions correctly and you answered 20 questions incorrectly and I take a sample of 10 from your questions take a sample of 10 and in my sample I have five correct answers and five incorrect answers. So I took a sample from your 100, sample of 10, and in my sample I have five questions that you answered correctly, five questions that you answered incorrectly. What is the result? Did you pass or fail? Based on this, did you pass or fail? If I were to make a conclusion based on my sample, you failed, right? This is called type 1 error. I am doing incorrect rejection. You actually not only passed, but you made a B because 80% is correct. But I'm saying you failed because I took a sample that is not representative. And this is a type 1 error where I incorrectly reject the grade. I incorrectly fail you, right? This is type 1 error. Is this clear? This is called type 1 error. My sample is rejecting the result incorrectly. This is called incorrect rejection. This is called type 1 error. Is that clear? The first one, type 1 error. I need you to respond so that I can understand whether you are with me on the same page. You understand type 1 error, yes? Type 2 error is Let's say you have another exam, 100 questions. You answered 50 correctly, 50 questions correctly, and 50 incorrectly. 
I have 100 questions, 50 answered correctly, 50 answered incorrectly, and I take a sample of 10. In that sample, I have eight correct answers and two incorrect answers, right? In my sample, I have eight answers that you answered correctly, eight questions that you answered correctly, and two questions that you answered incorrectly. Did you pass or fail based on my sample? Did you pass or fail? You passed. Not only did you pass, you made 80. You made a B. This is type 2 error. This is incorrect acceptance. I took a sample that shows that your grade is 80, where in, in reality it's 50. So this is incorrect conclusion. This is incorrect acceptance, right? So what is the terminology we use here, Ali? Not wrong sample. What is this sample? This is a sample that is, what do we call it in audit terminology? I just told you this in the previous slide. This is a sample that is not, it is not representative. It is not representative. The sample is not representative, right? It is not representative sample, right? Very good. Ali, very good. So this sample is not representative. It does not represent the population. The population is different. So you can have a type 1 error when you incorrectly reject it when the sample is actually good. And type 2 error is you incorrectly accept, is, accept it when the sample is not good. Right? There are many errors and you don't find them. Is that clear? Type 1 and type 2 error? Any confusion? Clear. Type 1 and type 2 error. Okay? So there is this risk of taking the not non-representative sample and that is called a sampling risk. So there is always a small sampling risk of taking a non-representative sample. The sample is not representing the population. And we try to minimize this risk by applying sampling techniques. But there is always a small risk, 5%, 3%, 1% risk. It can never be zero. The opposite of the risk is confidence level. So when you have a 5% risk that you have not taken a representative sample, you are 95% confident that you have taken a representative sample. 95% sure that your sample is representative and the conclusion you're going to make from that sample is representative of the population. So you have a 95% confidence level. So the sampling risk plus the confidence level is always 100%, right? So if you have a 97% confidence level, the sampling risk is 3%. If you have a 99% confidence level, the sampling risk is 1%. The sampling risk can never be zero unless one situation. And what is that situation? Can you guess? Can you think of it? Can you identify that one situation where you have 100% confidence level and zero sampling risk? Only one type of population? How will you know that it's a one type, only one type population? How will you know that all people are, all, everybody in the population is male? How will you know that? There's only one way to know that, and that is if you took the entire population as your sample. So you took everything. You sampled the entire population. You ask every single individual, are you male or female? In, in that case, you have taken the population as sample, 
there is no sampling risk because you did not sample you took everything in that case you have 100% confidence you have 100% confidence so in that case we don't need to sample we don't need to use any sampling techniques because we are not sampling we're taking everything and in some cases when we have small populations small uh, number of items we do take the entire population and we don't have to sample in that case we are not sampling in this case we are testing everything are you following right okay now the last set of concepts for today the first one is tolerable error tolerable error tolerable error is the amount of errors that you can have in your documents and still say the financial statements are true and fair so let's say in our exams in our courses what is the tolerable percentage that we have the students uh, miss and still make an A. What is the percentage of errors the student can have and still make an A in a course? What is that percentage? 10%, right? 10%. So 10% is the tolerable error for an A, right? A grade that the student will get. Even by missing 10%, the student can make an A. So that's the tolerable error. So in the case of reviewing the documents you're looking at the financial documents and you're looking at some calculations the client has done you have to set a tolerable error that okay if I find this many mistakes I would still say that the financial statements are true and fair and this tolerable error the percentage of tolerable error is calculated based on it's based on your experience with the client your understanding of the industry, the history of the client, many, many things in real life. For your purposes in this course, whenever you do a calculation, the tolerable error is going to be provided. You will be given the tolerable error, right? You'll be given the tolerable error, and you have to use that tolerable error. But you have to understand what this tolerable error means. Tolerable error means that this many errors you can have and still say that the financial statements are okay clear the next concept is expected error now understand this example let's say I have a student in my class and the student scored 98 out of 100 in the midterm exam so 98 out of 100 in the midterm exam and I am sitting down to grade the final exams I have that student's paper right student a let's say made 98 out of 100 in the midterm and I'm looking at the same students exam paper before I start grading what do I expect from this student do I expect this student to miss 10 points is that what I experienced before number wise right number wise out of 100 how much do I expect the student to miss points how many points even previously the student only missed two points what do I expect what is my expectation right it is less than 10 my expectation is less than 10 right maybe two three four right but not 10 I don't expect the student to miss 10 points that expectation is called expected error right so your clients history gives you an expectation that you only expect the client to miss or make so many mistakes the expected error is usually less than the tolerable error right the expected error is usually less than tolerable error so expected error is the number of errors you expect in the population tolerable error is how many you can tolerate the difference between these two numbers is called precision so let's say your tolerable is 10 and your expected is 3 then precision is going to be 7 so precision is the difference between the tolerable error and the expected error this is a calculated number okay and we're going to 
learn more about precision, we're going to learn about what to do with precision and how to use precision. But precision is defined as the difference between the tolerable error and the expected error. The difference between those two numbers is equal to precision. Is that clear? Okay, so we have learned a few concepts. The first one is representative sample. The second one is sampling risk, which can translate into type 1 error and type 2 error. And then we have learned confidence level. And then we have learned tolerable error, expected error, and precision. All right. Now, do you have any questions about any one of these? OK. Now, in a face-to-face -face class, I can look at uh, your facial expressions. And uh, I can look at your facial expressions to see how much you understand or whether you need more explanation and so forth. But here, I cannot. So I need you to tell me uh, between 1 and 5. 1 is, it's not clear at all. Five is, it is absolutely clear. Between one and five, give me a number of your understanding of today's concepts. Type in a number between one and five. So the lower expected errors is ob obviously always better, which makes the precision higher, right? That is correct. The higher the precision, the better. So do you understand my question? I asked you to do something that is, give me your understanding between 1 and 5. 1 is you understood clearly. Uh, un you did not understand clearly, I'm sorry. 5 is you understood clearly, and 2, 3, 4 in between. Give me a number. Type in a number between 1 and 5. So I have 4, Faisal has 3. Anybody else? Four. Motosem has three. Okay. Four. Okay. Very good. Four. Khaled has four. Very good. So to take your three or four to a level five, you need to do the following. First, listen to this audio one more time, but before that, read a few pages from your book or from any material you can access about representative sample, sampling risk, confidence level, tolerable expected errors, and precision. And then listen to the video again and enhance your understanding. Take it to a complete understanding so that when you come back on Thursday, you understand these concepts without any difficulty, like the back of your hand. Just like when you're looking at the back of your hand, you know that it's your hand. These concepts must be clear just like that before you come, okay? So that when we start using these concepts, you don't have to think. You know them very clearly. Clear what I'm asking you to do? Okay? I need you to respond. Is it clear what I'm asking you to do? Gentlemen, tell me. Yes. Very good. All right, then. Inshallah, I will see you Thursday morning. Please come on time. And those who are not coming, ask them to come because we are going to start running from Thursday. And if you don't understand these concepts, you will fall behind. All right. I will see you on Thursday, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa